So how, how many know what we're teaching on right now? Matthew chapter five through seven, the Sermon on the Mount, right? Some of you are like, I didn't know that. Wow. Um, so Jesus is training his disciples. And remember who his disciples are, tax collectors, former and fishermen. So people just like you and I, they were just natural people. Some of them pretty rough people. Tax collectors were considered pretty rough. So we now today are his current um, disciples. So he's training them. How many think we could get something out of what he's telling them? If he's telling them, this is what you need to be as a disciple, how many believe that, that could actually help you? It could actually help me. I'll, I'll be a disciple like they were. I want to be the same way. So we said this, the Sermon on the Mount is separated into four sections the way we're looking at it. Now, there's others that go deeper than that, further than that, into like real small sections. We're just doing four. So far, we've done two. We looked at the Beatitudes. We ended those with being a peacemaker two weeks ago, that Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you need to be a peacemaker. How many know you need to be a peacemaker, not just here at church, but outside of church, at your job? How about in your home? How about with your family? How about with your kids? Peacemaker. But then he ends it all up and says, you'll be persecuted for your faith. And we talked about the Beatitudes start with salvation and then that you're going to be persecuted because of your salvation. So we talked about all of that. Last weekend, we did section two. Could have done more on this, but we just did one weekend. You are salt and you are light. So Jesus said this, if you lose your saltiness, you are no good and you're not useful. So the moment we start to be people who treat people wrong, he says, that's when you become non-effective. Are y'all with me? So that was two sections. This weekend, we're starting section three. And here's what the overarching title will be, how to be great in the kingdom. I want to ask a question to start off. How many here would be interested on what you could do to be great in God's kingdom? I'm not talking about great here on earth. I'm talking about how could you and I be great in the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus is going to tell his disciples. Now, remember, in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Jesus goes up to a mountaintop to get away from the crowd so he could teach just his disciples. By the time we get to chapter 7 of Matthew, the crowd catches up, and Jesus shifts gears on what he's talking about. But right now, we're about to get into some interesting things that Jesus says. So I want you, I want you to know this. I know you could think, wow, why do we have to hear this? This is so redundant and so because you'll remember it. If we just keep on plowing that in there and keep on hearing it over and over again. But what Jesus is about to talk about is some of the most interesting things that you can hear. So I have an actual subtitle. If you want to jot this down this weekend, I'm going to talk to you from this angle, the law, good or bad. I want you to write that down if you're taking notes. Our notes are available if you want to copy them. The law, good or bad. So some of you, if you're new to church, like when I was new to church, I didn't even know what the law was. I was raised in a denomination that actually lived under the law, but I didn't know that until I accepted Christ in my life. Then I realized, oh, most of the stuff we did, we were living under the law. So the question for you and I is, is the law good or is the law bad for Christ followers? Some people believe there's a complete disconnect. We don't want anything to do with the law. Other people believe we should go back under the law and live in it as a Christian. Um, I will just tell you this, both of those are wrong. And we're going to look at what Jesus literally had to say about this. But before I jump in, I want, I want to say this to you real quick. I was reading a book a while back, and I, when I read books, sometimes I like to also listen to them. So I'll, I'll, I'll read them separately, but then I like listening to them just to get more out of it. And I, I was listening to this book and reading it, and the individual said this. He said, the Old Testament, because that's where the law is found. We'll talk more about it in a moment. It's pretty much worthless. We should all just get rid of it. And I was like, I don't think I read that in the book, but I'm hearing that when I'm listening to it. It must be in there. So I went back to try to find it. I did find it, and I was like, whoa. This is a pretty prominent guy. And what he said was, basically, you can get rid of the Old Testament. In fact, it got so crazy that some of the people that follow him, they came to their churches on weekends and said, if you want, you can just rip the Old Testament out of your Bible. You don't, you don't need it. Now, I want to just tell you why that's flawed in many levels and dangerous. I would not know, and you would not know, about creation unless you had Genesis. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about creation. I, I wouldn't know this, and I know many of you don't know this, and you're new to church, so don't, don't get mad at me because I'm going to say this. Just listen to what I'm going to say. I would have never known that marriage is between a man and a woman until I read the Old Testament. Now, Jesus talks about some things in the, in the he's still under the old, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he'll talk about things. I would have never known this. Without the Old Testament, I would have never known that when a, when a mom becomes pregnant, the moment she becomes pregnant, that baby is alive. Amen. It's not an embryo like the world teaches you. This is what the Bible says. So all of a sudden, I, I'm like, oh, wow, let's throw out the thing that gives us the moral compass that we have. So if you throw the Old Testament out, it's good for something. It's not to be thrown out. And we're going to show you what, what it's good for in a moment. But for all of you that are younger, that are here, first of all, I appreciate that you guys sit where you do. But here's what I want you to say. If you're younger or you're older and you've gone through some of the schooling that did this, they wanted to let you know that you don't need this Bible at all. But without your Bible, you have no moral compass. Without the Old Testament, you have no idea some of the things that God said, that this is what his word says. I know the world says something different. And I know there are some of you right now that you're like, I'm going to get you afterwards. And it's all cool. Here's the thing. This is not my opinion. This is not how I interpret it. This is literally, it says, a man and a woman will marry. The woman will leave her mom and her dad. So the Greek Hebrew language says this, the Hebrew says they'll be glued together. The Greek word and the Hebrew word, both if you take them out of either translations, because you can do that, it says it's like the definition we would have. It's like glue that comes together where you cannot ever separate it. Jesus comes along in the New Testament and talks about marriage a little bit. And they're asking him about marriage. And he said, well, Moses gave you the law he gave about you could divorce because you had hard hearts. He said, that's not the way it was from the beginning. Jesus is like, I want to just tell you this. I'm going to give you a quote later about this, but let me just tell you this. You think the law was harsh and hard? Jesus comes along and says, hey, the standard of the law was here. I'm going to give you a new standard, and it's not going to be down here. Are you all with me? We'll talk about it in a moment. I want to go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. I know you're all so interested right now. You guys are amazing. Verse 17 through 19, I can hear Stowe shouting all the way from Stowe and Fairlawn. Amen to me. Anyway, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do you think that I came, Jesus speaking, red letter, to destroy. Everyone say destroy. The law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but I came to fulfill. So if you are like me, in the background that I, when I came to Christ, I did not know any of this. So the first five books of the Bible are considered the law. So your first five books, starting at Genesis, five books in the law. There are 17 books in between until you get to the other things that he talks about, which are the last 17 books of the Old Testament are called the prophets. 17 books in between the first five and the last 17, there's 17 other books. They're called uh, the book of wisdom, Proverbs, Psalms, and they're history. So let's do this. Let's get it in our minds right now that you need your whole Bible, not part of it. Now, here's what's crazy. So that statement was made, right, that, that I told you about. There are New Testament churches that have ripped out parts of their New Testament. I've actually heard a pastor one time, his name is John Osteen. His son is Joel. And John was preaching one time and he was formerly a Baptist background preacher and he did not believe in being spirit filled at all. Like the, what we believe here at our church. He said, I was up there preaching and I got to this stuff in first Corinthians. And then he finally said, I just said, I don't even know what I'm talking about and walked off the platform. I'm like, well, at least he admitted he didn't know what he was talking about. Later, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and his life was completely changed. And of course, now we know the history of John Osteen and Joel Osteen, pretty amazing history. Why I'm saying all of that is this. I'm not ripping out any part of my Bible. I don't know about you, but I want the whole thing. I want the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth of the word of God. Amen. All right, let's go. Um, whole idea. Is the law good or bad? Watch this, verse 18. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away. Has heaven and earth passed away yet? 
It seems like it's getting closer that it could happen, but it hasn't happened. He says, not one jot, that word is in the Hebrew language, stroke, or one tittle, which is the smallest letter of the Hebrew language, will by no means pass away from the law till it's fulfilled. Verse 19, now watch. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so or to do so shall be called least into the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said you don't go against the law. And understand this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's writing and talking to people that are under the law. We're not under the law. If you're here and you say, well, I, I, was just, I just accepted Christ last year. You're not under the law. You'll never will be. But that doesn't mean you throw it away. And in fact, there's still something very important as we get close to the end in a few minutes about the law that you need to understand. I fulfill the law every single day of my life as a Christ follower by one thing. You're like, wow, I just want to know what that one thing is. And we're going to get, we're going to get to it. Some of you might already know. We'll get to it in a moment. But I want you to see something in verse 17. We'll go back to that. Do not think I came to destroy, abolish, overthrow is what the Greek says, the law or the prophets. I did not do that. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. So when Jesus came to this planet, guys, he came to fulfill the law, not to do away with it. And you and I, there's something he says in Paul, the apostle, if you do this, you'll fulfill the law. So I want to show you what that is. This weekend, I want to just take a few moments and I want to show you what is it that you and I can do and it says we fulfill the whole law. I love this about the New Testament and the New Covenant. We get to do one thing and we fulfill the law. I want you to hear this. Did you know under the um, Old Testament, there are 613 commandments? 600, you heard, heard me right. Not 10 commandments, 613. Can you imagine if you and I had to follow every one of those commandments? But do you know what Paul said? Do you know what Jesus said? There's one thing you can do and you'll fulfill them all. Oh, awesome. Just one thing. I like it when it's easy. Amen. Like one thing that you and I have to do and we fulfill the law. But guys, when you throw away the law, when you throw away what the Bible says in the Old Testament and say, I don't need that. And here's what's happened to Christians. You probably heard it before. Well, I'm redeemed from that. Well, you're redeemed from the curse of the law. You're not redeemed from living under its standards. You're redeemed from the curse. Are you all with me? So I don't, I'm, not, I'm redeemed from all this stuff they had to do. So what are you redeemed from? Guess what? You don't have to kill a lamb, have one raised in your backyard, and then kill it to sacrifice. You don't have to do that. You're redeemed. If you had a hole that you dug at your house for whatever reason, you're a farmer and you had this hole, and someone else's animal fell in it, you had to give them restitution under the law. You had to repay them back. Under our covenant now, first of all, we don't have the lambs in our backyard. Some of you might have some chickens and that kind of a thing now. Um, but most of us don't have lambs in our backyard. We don't have to become like, they're little, they're so cute. They've gotten bigger. And then we're like, sorry, buddy. Today's your day. How many are glad we don't have to do that? So we don't, we don't live under the laws that they lived in. But it's in the Old Testament. It says this, hey, you shouldn't commit adultery. You think that changes under grace? Oh, no, man, under grace, I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. Listen to what grace, and if you want to jot this down, you can. Grace empowers you to live like Jesus. Grace is an empowerment for you to live the way that Jesus lived when he walked on this earth. Grace doesn't do this. Because I'm under grace, I can sin and do anything that I want. No, grace empowers you to overcome sin. Come on, are you with me? Yes. Now, I know some of you are staring at me like, whoa, man, this is, like, this is a lot of stuff. So I want to just give you a couple quotes. They're actually on my notes. They're going to be on the screen also. But if you're following along, you get that QR code. You can follow along with this. Um, w. Perkins, who's a, a scholar, says this about the word fulfill. He says Christ fulfilled three different ways. First of all, Christ fulfilled the law by his doctrine. And he simply says this, both by restoring to it its proper meaning and true use, He's really talking about the Old Testament and by revealing the light, the right way in which the law may be fulfilled. 
So we're going to talk about that just in a moment. And then Jesus fulfilled the law, how? In his person, both by performing perfect and perpetual obedience, I'm quoting him, unto his, un, unto his precepts, and by suffering its penalty, enduring death upon the cross for his people. How many are you glad that Jesus died on the cross? We're coming up against Easter not long from now, but he didn't just die on the cross. He didn't stay in the grave. Come on now. He's the only one that came up from the dead. I know he rose up, Lazarus. We understand that, but that's Jesus raising him up. Jesus went into the grave. He was there for three days, three nights. He went into hell. He paid a price for you and I. He came out of the grave so you and I could have eternal life. He did that, and what did it do? It proved this is the Son of God. There were, there were Roman soldiers saying when Jesus died that he didn't even resurrect yet. He died, and that veil was torn from the bottom to the top. Actually, from the top to the bottom. It's torn, like someone just went and tore it. You know what the Roman soldier said? He truly was the son of God. Wow. So you and I, we should be able to look at it now, reading scripture. You understand the Old Testament was given another reason to show us that we needed a savior. All those laws were given to show you, you never will meet them all. You need a savior. The law showed us we were sinners. Jesus came for who? He said, I didn't come for those who don't need a physician and they're fine, they're healthy. I came for those that need a physician that are unhealthy, that are unrighteous. I came for them. He came for us that needed a savior. Third thing, Jesus proved and fulfilled by doing it in men, in the elect, by imparting faith into our hearts so that they lay hold of Christ who fulfilled it for them and by giving them his own spirit, which imparts to them a love for the law that sets them on a course to endeavor to obey it. But I want to show you what, what do we have to obey? Because when you hear that, you can think, oh, I have to obey the law. I want you to know, I don't know what the 613 commandments are. I know what 10 of them are, but I don't know the 613. And you might be like, well, you should learn them. Well, why I don't know them is because the Bible says you can fulfill all of them by doing one thing. Why would I want to go learn the 613 when if I just find out what the one thing is I need to do, it kicks me into fulfilling all of them. So I want to help you do that. And I know you might be like, wow, I didn't know that. So let's watch. I want to show you something that Jesus says. This is, this is sort of like one of the most important parts. So listen to what I'm going to tell you right now. In Matthew 5, 21, we're going to get to this later in our series. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old or by those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say, everyone say that out loud. But I say, Jesus is telling them, this is what the law says, but I'm going to tell you something a little bit different. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, we're going to talk about this stuff in the, in the next couple of weeks. But Jesus just tells them, let me tell you something a little bit different. Verse 31. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32. But I say, Jesus tells them something totally different. So if you're taking notes, this will be on the screen. Listen, Jesus said, the law says this, but I say this. Each time he proceeds to tell them the bar of our standard of living is higher under Jesus than it was under the old covenant, which would be lower. Under the old covenant, he said, you have permission to go ahead and, and, and get a divorce. Moses said that. Jesus said, I'm gonna tell you something different. You have one reason why you can get a divorce. That's what he goes on and says. Smile on your brother. Murder. Jesus said, you know what? You're not supposed to murder you. It says in the Old Testament, but I'm gonna tell you something a little more crazy. You can think thoughts up here that are murder, just like it is when you go physically murder them, you're thinking it right up here about a person. Getting quiet in this church. <laughs> so Jesus says, I'm gonna give you a standard that is higher than the law, and you don't have to live under the law anymore. Let me just give you a higher standard of living. Are you all with me? So in Romans chapter three, watch what Paul says. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith whether they are Jews or Gentiles. That's all about salvation. Verse 31, well then, 
If we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? It's a question. Look at the next part. Of course not. What? Can we forget the law? Of course not. You can't forget the law. The law is still important. Jesus is quoting something from the Old Testament and telling them, this is what the law says, here's what I say. Paul's saying, hey, you can't forget the law. We need the law. In fact, he says, in fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. So Paul says one way is when we put faith in God, we start fulfilling the law. When you receive Christ, you start fulfilling the law, but it doesn't end there, guys. So I wanna talk to you about this real quickly and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time, but here's the question I'm asking you today. Is the law good or is the law bad? In your mind, do you think, man, the law is good or bad? Here's what the uh, scholars say about the law. The law of God was given to Moses and it is a comprehensive set of guidelines to ensure that the Israelites' behavior reflected their status as God's chosen people. God gave them the law so they would live under the law so what they look like and act like actually reflected their God's children. You and I don't have to live under the law. Instead, we fulfill the law when we accept Christ into our life. That's step one. But then there's something after you accept Christ. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to spend just a few moments on this. I want you to see this real quickly. Um, I'm going to go in Scripture right now to Luke 24, 44. Jesus had risen from the dead, came back and talked to the disciples. He says in verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, that's that word again, which are written in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So here's what I want you to get before we move on. If it was murder under the Old Testament, murder is still murder under the new. If it was adultery under the Old Testament, it's still adultery under the New Testament. If it was stealing under the old, it's stealing under the new. Some of you are brand new to church, so your, your, your minds right now just sort of like blown away. Wait, 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 wait. Like Jesus gets into these nitty gritty things like this? Jesus takes everything to a higher level. Like Jesus doesn't want you to steal. But some of you think, I don't go to work and steal stuff from work. But did you know, I know this might get you, but did you know when you go there and you don't actually work, you're stealing from the place you work from? All right, I'm out. So as Christ followers, a man or a woman could be at work looking at the opposite sex. And the Bible says you're committing adultery just doing the thought thing. Jesus said that, not Moses. We can have thoughts here that are thinking thoughts about something wrongly and we're doing something up here. And Jesus said, it's the same exact thing. You're like, I didn't go out and commit adultery, but up here, there's something going on. All right, so we'll move right along. Matthew chapter five, watch this, verse 18. First, surely I say to you, Jesus talking, same thing, till heaven and earth passes away. That hasn't happened. One jot or one tittle, those small little parts will by no means pass away. So here's what I found out about Jesus. In the New Living Bible, it says it a little different, and I'll tell you, until heaven and earth disappear. Not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So here's what Jesus does. Jesus starts getting into finer details than Moses did. Moses will say, hey, you shouldn't do this. Jesus comes along and says, I'm gonna tell you you shouldn't do that, but I'll even give it further to you. You can't even think a thought like that. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, it's like, all right, that's, that's just amazing. He starts getting into the nitty gritty details. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Jesus goes to the heart. He's like, what's going on in here? It's not just the action. The action can happen and it's wrong, but it's what goes on in here that matters. And we're gonna talk about that more in the weeks to come. So I wanna show you in closing this up, we're not done yet, but as we start heading down that direction, I wanna show you how you can fulfill the law in your life. Are you ready to see that? Oh, yeah. Let me see your hands. How many are ready to see? Okay, how can I fulfill the law? All right, watch this. Paul's writing. Now, I want you to remember, Jesus used the Old Testament. Paul used the Old Testament to, to write all the things they have in the New Testament. But watch this. Galatians 5, 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. 
Oh, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's not one word for all of you that didn't notice. The law is fulfilled in one word. Even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Scholars say it is one word. It's the word love. How do you fulfill the law? You love people the way that Jesus loves them. But pastor, I can't. Pastor, they're a different political persuasion. I just can't. Just can't. Listen closely. Some misunderstandings that we have. I love you and you're doing stuff that's completely wrong. It doesn't mean I agree with you. But I will love you. Are you all with me? See, the culture today, the society today has really gotten it messed up. If you say, I have a stance, I believe abortion is wrong, and I believe that God creates a person in the mother's womb, and it's breathing right then. Uh, it's alive right then. You are crazy. You're one of those people. You're a crazy conservative. No, no, I have a stance that goes along with the Bible. It doesn't mean I don't like you or dis dislike you or not love you because you believe something different, but I will not change my belief because you believe the way you do. Right. Are you, y'all understanding what I'm talking about? I'm going to keep the belief that goes along with the word. So let's, let's read another place. Romans eight, verse three and four. He says for the law, verse three, what the law could not do that it was weak through the flesh. The flesh means the lower nature. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus came in a body just like you and I have on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now watch that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The day that you accept Christ, if you will walk driven and led by the Holy Spirit, you will fulfill the law. You will love people that are unlovely. You will love people that think different than you. You will love people totally the way that God said to do it. And what, what are you doing when you love people? You're fulfilling the law. I don't have to go through and do 613 laws that I must fulfill. I fulfill the law from the old covenant by loving people the way Jesus did. So let's go over here back to Matthew verse 19. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so will be called least in the kingdom. But watch whoever does and teaches them how to deliver those commandments shall be called great in the kingdom. Who wants to be great in the kingdom? I want to see your hands one more time. How do you and I become great in the kingdom? We love people the way Jesus did. Did I say we agree with everything that they do? No. Did I say that I sort of ignore that they're doing like crazy wrong stuff? No, I didn't say any of that. But I will love them because Jesus said to love them. And I will not go up to them and say this. I love you because Jesus said to love you. Okay, great. Awesome but I don't agree with one thing you're doing. You don't have to tell them that. You just walk in the love of God, love people the way Jesus did. You don't have to go up to people and tell them what you disagree with them about. So let me give you just real quick. I know you all know this, but you know that little thing we had back in 2020? Everyone remember that? COVID? They're still trying to make a deal of it now, but it, let's all admit it, it's pretty much done. But anyway, 2020, it was crazy. It happened in March. In fact, we just finished Love is Red and it was going, that's when all of it hit back in March of 2020. It was crazy. No one knew what was really happening. No one knew, are, are you gonna die if you get COVID? And we, we, had people, we had a person on our staff who died who had COVID. Margaret, who is one of our family care team members, she went home to be with Jesus. I mean, it, it was pretty, pretty sad what happened. But man, I want, to, I want to tell you what happened from 2020 till now, people lost something. You know what they lost? Loving like Jesus loved. Man, people were, they're getting on their platforms of whatever they might be, and they're letting everyone know how wrong you are. And then, you know, you understand people are looking at your platforms that don't even know Jesus. So now they're hearing you tell them how wrong and how bad they are, and they don't even know Christ yet. So you and I have, we have, we have an obligation, guys. Listen, you and I have an obligation that every platform that God gives us, 
whether it's social media or whether it's something else. When we have a platform from God, our platform is to love people the way God loves people. And when we love people the way God loves people, we are now fulfilling the law. The Bible says, Pastor Mike did not say this. Jesus said it, Paul said it. All the law is fulfilled in one thing. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul said, love your neighbor as yourself. So in closing this up this weekend, here's my question to you. Is there something that you need to make an adjustment in your heart? Because if you want to be great in the kingdom, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to be a person who loves. Why? Why do you need to love people that, why did Jesus teach his disciples? Why do you, what's he wasting paper for? Like, why do you have to love people like this, Jesus? Why, what, what do you have to care about the law? What, who cares? Because listen to this, as Christ followers, we are to be the bridge between lost world and the kingdom of God. You and I are the bridge. You want someone to come to the kingdom of God and come to Jesus? We're the bridge that brings them there. So I want to close with this in Romans chapter 13, and we'll close this up. Verse eight through 10. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. What? Oh, nothing to anyone except one thing, to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. What? If you love one another. Now, guess what? This is gonna be awesome. On your way out of church today, you have, an, you have an, a moment where you can practice love. Like there's crowds, there's people, there's gonna be parking lot stuff going on. There's going to be people telling you stop, and you're going to be like, I have to love. I don't want to love right now, but I'm going to have to love. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever had that neighbor? When our kids were little, we had this neighbor that was, lived next to us, and our kids were throwing the ball over into this guy's yard all the time. This was when we lived in Maslin, Ohio, and um, we just had moved to town. Our kids are little. They're four and six, throwing this over there. And finally, this guy, he just got, he, there were times he'd throw it back at the kids. There were times I just wanted to walk over and say, you know what? You throw that ball over that fence one more time and that ball will be in your face. Like I, I wanted to just go let him know, but I'm the pastor. So I'm like, dang, can't do that. But anyway, just kidding, just kidding. But you know what? We just loved him. And eventually the guy was fine. So if you're here and you're that cranky old guy to your neighbor's kids, stop it. Right? Don't be that guy. Oh, no one anything. So you know what I owed that guy? I owed him nothing but love. I wanted to tell him off. I wanted to tell him a piece of my mind. Sometimes people don't need a piece of our mind. You should keep yours. Y'all you, you need it as much as you can. But he says, here's what we're to do. He says, we're to love one another for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then I want to read this to you as, uh, just real quickly for the commandment says this. Now he's going back to the 10 commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet, meaning I want something that someone else has. And if there is any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying. So all the commandments now, everything, 613 right here. He said, they're all summed up. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I know some of you are thinking, well, they're not really my neighbor. So I don't really like them and I actually hate them, but they're not my neighbor. I'm not doing what he said. What he's talking about, you love people. It's not neighbor, not the neighbor you live next to. Watch verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, to another person. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Guys, in closing, I just wanna encourage you with this. We should be overboard on love than, more than anything else. We as Christ followers should be overboard on the love side, loving people. So I wanna close with your thought going here. What's the word love mean? When you look it up in the Greek language, the word love comes from the Greek word agape. There's actually four different words for love, but the one Jesus used here in other places, agape. And agape is the highest kind of love is what the Greek talks about. And it's the kind of love that gives something but never expects anything in return. So when you hear this, for God so loved the world, the Greek says, for God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did what? God agape. He loved you and I so much 
that he gave his son. He expects nothing in return by giving him. So there are gonna be times when you have a neighbor that you need to love them and you're gonna get nothing in return. Listen, there are gonna be times in your marriage where you're gonna have to give love and you don't get it in return. There are gonna be times with your kids that you're gonna love them and it feels like you don't get anything in return. Anyone ever have that? I mean, I remember being the kid that did that to the parents, so I know you all know what I'm talking about. But then you get older, you start having kids and you're like, man, my mom and dad were like geniuses. I didn't realize how much they knew. Because then you start having kids and you realize how much I don't know. And man, my mom and dad were right about that. My mom and dad were, were right about that. Listen, guys, when you love the way Jesus loves, you expect nothing in return. We'd like to get something in return. I understand that. But there are going to be times you have to love and there's nothing coming in back in return. Just love like Jesus did. Pastor, how long should we love? Well, that's an awesome question. Jesus was asked that in two different gospels. It says it two different ways. He said, hey, the disciples came and said, hey, how many times in a day do I have to forgive? Because, you know, if someone's walking out of love, you're probably going to have to forgive them multiple times. And Jesus said seven. Seven's not bad. I can do that. But then in the other gospel, it says 70 times seven. For all of you that aren't real good at math, that's 490 times in a day. I don't have my wife do stuff to me that 490 times in a day, I have to say, all right, I've been counting them. One more time, I have to forgive. But how many know there is that person at work? There is that boss. There is that somebody that you're like, oh no, they get, they get up real close to that pastor. They're right up near the 490. I know they are. But what does Jesus say? Jesus gives a ridiculous number. Why? Because he wants you to know you need to love people even when it's some outrageous, ridiculous amount of times. What do we need to do? We need to forgive them. We need to love them. Is there someone here, not right in this room right now, but is there someone here that you're thinking in your mind right now, I know who, I know I, I, need to, I need to love that person. See, if you walk in love, the God kind of love, the kind of love that expects nothing in return, it will melt the heart of other people. You wanna melt the heart of your mate? Love them unconditionally, because that's what this kind of love is. I'm not loving you because I want something. I'm loving you because God said to love this way. Is anyone understanding what I'm talking about? Y'all looking like, oh no. So here's what we're gonna do, or take a moment. I don't want anyone to leave yet. I know you want to leave, but you're going to walk in love and stay. Listen closely. Who's the person or who are the people that right now you have to think about and say, okay, God, I need love. I've been not loving. I've been not loving to my kids. I've been not loving to my wife. I've been not loving to my husband, whoever it might be. I need to make an adjustment right now. So I want to take a moment. I want to ask you if you'll stand, but not be dismissed. All right, let's just stand. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment and search our hearts and ask this question. How can I better treat people the way Jesus said to treat them and Paul said to treat them? How can I love people the way that God said to? I mean, when you think about this message and where it all started about, is the law good or is the law bad? The law is good so that it helps us to keep a moral compass. But we fulfill all of the law we just love people. What if I just loved you regardless of the fact that you're doing something that sort of makes me mad, doesn't make me happy? I'm not talking about being abused. I'm not, that's not where I'm going with this. But what I'm talking about is just because your wife is snippy to you, do you still love like Jesus loves? Just because your husband is doing, you know, I mean, that guy will not clean the toothpaste out of that sink. He never does. He's a slob. But what does love do? All right, so... Y'all, y'all thinking, is that what you do, Pastor Mike? No, I don't do that. But I'm sure there are things that I do that my wife's like, I'm walking in love today. I am positive. When she drives in the same car as me, I know that she's walking in love. Just her having to put up what I do when I drive. But who is it that you right now need to just say, okay, God, I need to love. Let's close our eyes just for a moment. Father, we come to the throne. We know there's people that we need to love that we've not been loving towards. We've not had actions of love toward them. 
Father, right now, first of all, forgive us for anyone that we've walked out of love. We want to fulfill the law. We want to be great in the kingdom by being people of love. As we stand in your presence here just for a moment, we give you our hearts. We give you everything. We ask you to help us love the way that Jesus loves, Father. Help us love. You said that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Help us love people better. We now stand in your presence and ask for your help. We ask you to speak to our hearts. Who do I need to make an adjustment? Treating them the way that Jesus wants them treated. We lay our hearts open right now to you. As we just take a moment, search your heart, let God speak to you. That little still small voice on the inside of you thinking, oh, I need to go call my grandma. I need to go call my mom, my dad, whoever. Let that little voice speak on the inside of you and then follow through with whatever you're hearing. We open our hearts to hear from heaven right now. As we were worshiping, I felt like I needed to just share this um, that came into my heart. So I think if, if you're thinking this, if you're thinking, I gotta get back into this relationship and love this person who's been abusive to me, I want you to hear me clearly. You can love from a distance. You do not need to get back into any relationship where there has been abuse. Stay as far away from it as you can. Don't go back into it. So I just wanna make sure you, you heard that. As, just for one moment, if you will just remain with us. Um, this is the most important part of our worship experience. You hear me say that frequently. So if you could just stay not moving around just for a moment, I really would appreciate it. But let's just close our eyes, get in the presence of God. And if you're here and say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus personally. If I died, I am not sure that I would ever get to heaven. I don't know. I, th I think I've done enough works. And what we know is you cannot be justified by the law. Galatians talks about it. And you cannot be justified by works. So you can't be made right with God by doing certain things that are good things that you might think oh, that'll get me to heaven. In order to get to heaven, the Bible says you have to come to this recognition. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. In order to get to heaven, you literally have to say, okay, I am ready to repent from the way that I've been living, which means turn from, and I'm gonna turn to God. So if you're here and say, pastor, I've never done that. I've never received Christ into my life or into my heart. Or pastor, I did that at one time but I will honestly admit I am far from God right now. I've gotten away from God. What you need is a fresh commitment to be made right here, right now. So his eyes are closed. If you're here and say, pastor, that's me. I want you to pray this prayer. We're gonna all do it together. We're gonna join with you. But if you need Christ in your heart or you need to recommit, I want you to pray this simple prayer. Eyes are closed, say it with me. Oh God, I repent of my sins. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I thank you now that Jesus, you are my savior. I call you savior. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I thank you now, I'm saved. I thank you that you are my father and Jesus, you are my savior. I thank you for it now in Jesus name, amen. Now his eyes are closed just for one more moment. If you just prayed that prayer. You just asked Christ into your heart or you just recommitted your life to him and said, you know what? I made it a fresh commitment. I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. If you did that, would you do me a favor? The step of faith is simply this. Would you simply just raise your hand? No one's looking around. Just say, pastor, I prayed that prayer. I received Christ into my life. I just received him as my savior. Just raise that hand. Or I recommitted my life to Christ. Raise them real, real high. There are hands all over this room up in the air right now. Let's give it up for all of those that have raised their hand. Congratulations. Before we do anything else, I wanna just talk to those that raised their hand. First of all, congratulations. And second of all, you need a church. And if you're here and you say, man, I've never been in church before, you need to be in a place that preaches the Bible and you need to be in a place that's gonna teach you what God says and you need to take a next step. And I would encourage you, if you just raise your hand, your next step would be starting point. You can find out more about that out in the foyers when you're walking out. But as you're taking your seats and sticking with us for just a couple more minutes, take your seats. Let's give it up for those people that just raised their hand.